What is the gospel? They say it's good news. But why? It seems as though it is simply a list of do's and don'ts, and we keep beating ourselves up for not being able to obey them all. No, the gospel can't be law. The gospel has to do with death, but the death of sin, so that we can truly live. The gospel isn't a one-time thing. It is a journey, a journey through every area of life, a journey through our ups and downs, a journey through trials and triumphs, a journey to the Father's kingdom, a journey that needs to be rediscovered. Father God in heaven, we ask that as we open up your word this morning, that your spirit would give us understanding, that your spirit would give us ears to listen, that he give us eyes to see, and that he would give us a heart and an attitude to surrender to you. So God, this morning we ask nothing but that you speak to us, that you teach us, that you'd show us your beauty and your glory. It's in your name we pray, amen. Amen. Good morning. We hope you guys are doing well this morning. We are in our series of re- called Rediscovering the Gospel. And Pastor Brian did a beautiful job last week pointing out the misconceptions that many people have about the gospel and then outlining for us what the gospel truly is. And so this morning, we're going to look at what is the power of of the gospel. And we're going to be in the book of Romans chapter 1. So if you have your Bible, you can turn to that Romans chapter 1. And I have, I have a question I want to ask you guys. Have you guys ever had a time in your life when you saw something somewhere, maybe you experienced it, maybe it's a picture where you sat back and you're like, man, that's just wrong. This shouldn't be that way. This is absolutely terrible. Well, I, I want to show you a few examples. Um, one of our friends, Sean Wilson over here, he showed me a, a video that I'm not even going to describe it other than to say, just check this out. Now, okay, that video, that's a horrible idea, right? Sean sent that to us. He showed me that because we have a cat, and he's really fat. He, he truly is a fat cat, this little big orange fur ball. And I've never sat back ever and said, you know what? I wish that I could lick my cat. <laughs> like, he licks me. I wish I could do that in return. What a, a, a wrong, horrible idea. Or I, I want to show you something else, Okay. Um, how about this sign? I want you, to... you get... Let me know when you get it. Let me know when you get it. It's a boy with princess stuff. Okay, something happened. Something is drastically wrong. Or what about this? M me and Big Mike were driving a few months ago. And we're in Miami. This only happens in Miami, folks, okay? Port Boulevard to the left. No left turn. What exactly do I do? The light's about to change green soon. I don't know what to do. Do I go left? Do I get pulled over? What's the sign is wrong, folks. I'm telling you. That's why there's accidents in Miami. Or what about this next one? Now, there's a few things wrong with that. Number one, how did it end up in the pool? Number two, how do you get it out? And three, what do you do with it once you get it out? Like, what's the plan here? So when you see that situation, it's, it's wrong, this is bad, it's gone very terrible right now. But here's what I want to say. Those things, there's a lot of things we could look at and say, man, that's wrong. Those things are wrong. And those are minor consequences. But then there are other things in the world that are serious. And when we see these things and when we witness them, when we experience them, we sit back and we say, something is wrong. There are things in the world that are drastically and horribly, terribly wrong. For example, I have a picture here of Syrian children 
that are caught in the civil war in Syria. Innocent lives are being killed. We sit back and we say, something is wrong with our world. You look at what's going on with ISIS and all the atrocities that they are committing, and you sit back, something is wrong with our world. Something that is supposed to be right is causing so much damage and so much pain and so much hurt. We look at our own country, United States of America, and racial tensions are getting terribly high. Our country is going from bad to worst fast. And we sit back and we can see that something is wrong. Personally, we can look at our lives and see that there are things that are wrong in our life, whether it's people that we know suffering from addictions, whether it's the death of a loved one, whether it's disease and sickness that is wreaking havoc in our own personal lives. Maybe it's financial struggles. Maybe it's depression. Maybe it's murders that are happening to families. And we sit back and we say, something is desperately wrong with this world. What things should be is not the way that they are. There is pain and suffering all over. And here's what happens. When that suffering enters our life, How many of us have found the place where we sit back and we go, God, where is your justice? God, if you're good and you're here, why are you doing nothing? Are you going to do anything about all this wrong that is in this world? And we sit back and we wait, wondering, what is God going to do about all the wrong in this world? So morning we're going to look at the answer to these questions and we're going to give the biblical answer. The answer is yes, God is good. Yes, God is here. And yes, he has and will do something to put the world to rights. And this morning we're going to examine that. In today's text, in, chap- in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 will be where we are this morning. Before we dive in, I want to just give you a little... I want to preface it with this. I want you to put your seatbelts on because we're going to fly through some scriptures here. I want you to be ready to turn your Bible. Just don't turn too fast. Your pages might catch on fire, okay? So, but uh, we're going to go through these verses, and I want to give you a, a, we're going to go back up a little bit to give you a big picture of what God has done to right the wrongs in the world since the problems have arisen. And so this morning, we're going to dive in, and then we're going to step back. Are you with me? All right, here's what it says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So I have two questions that we're going to ask today. The first one is this. What is the gospel? As we sit back, what is it? What is this backstory that God has been doing all along? What has he been setting out to do to put the world back to rights? To get that picture, I want you to jump up to Romans chapter 1, the very first few verses. Because the Apostle Paul, in the beginning of his letter, this letter, gives us what the gospel is. He says this. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. First thing Paul says that we need to understand is that this gospel is God's gospel. Amen? This is not something that Paul says he came up with. It's not something that Paul created because he sat back and said, Jesus is a good man. He did many good things. He was a great teacher. Therefore, let me create a religion for him. That's not what it is. He sits back and says, this is God's gospel that was given to us since the beginning. 
In verses 2 through 4, you can see that it's set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the holy what? Scriptures. Now, is Paul reading the New Testament? Trick question. No. His scriptures were the Old Testament. So when he's reading the Old Testament, he's saying this gospel is what God has been saying from the beginning. This is not something that is unheard of. It's not something Paul is just creating. He's saying this is God's story all along. This is how God has been working in and through mankind to put the world to rights. It's just when it comes to Jesus, he does something unexpected and surprisingly new. You with me? Here's what I want you to get this morning. Verse 16, at the end of it, says this. Salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. I want you to catch what Paul is doing here. He uses these two words, Jew first and the Greek. And what is Paul saying here? Paul's saying is that God has been working in the lives of all of mankind. God is not bringing his salvation just to the Jews. God is not bringing his salvation just to the Gentiles and the Greeks. God has been working in mankind to bring salvation to the world, to the nations, to everyone, no matter where you come from. Salvation is available to you. You see, we have to understand that the Apostle Paul was a Jew. Not only was he Jew, he was a Pharisee. Not only was he a Pharisee, but he was a Pharisee of one of the strictest sects in the Pharisee world. His sect believed that they had every right, if people were not obeying God's law, that they would force them, even using violence. Paul called himself a zealot, and zealots believed that they could bring God's people into submission using a knife. This is the Apostle Paul. And in Jewish world, this is how they thought of the world. There were Jews and non-Jews. That's how the Jewish people thought about the world. You were Jew or a non-Jew. The Greeks thought of the world as Greek and then the barbarians. Greeks and the non-Greeks. And what Paul does here is he says, look, salvation is offered to Jews and Greeks, Jews and Gentiles, which means all of mankind. And we could sit back and we might say, where does Paul get this idea from? Does God just pull this mankind, does Paul pull mankind out of thin air and just create this idea? It's not where he gets it from. He gets it from scriptures. I want you to look at, turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 5. You see, the Apostle Paul has read scripture. And under the illumination of the Holy Spirit, he reads these scriptures, and God brings these things to mind and gives him a new understanding of what God has been doing all along. And so when he's reading and he sits back and he goes through and he sees these things in scriptures, God brings it to mind for him to say, look, salvation is for all of mankind, and here's where it is. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, this is what it says. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and named them man when they were created. The next thing in your notes, I put it this way. I put, the gospel is the story of mankind. It is the story of mankind. In the English translation, it's not easy to see. But in the Hebrew language, it is so clear to see where Paul gets mankind from. Because it says, he created male and female, he created them, blessed them, and named them man. In our English translations, it says man. But the Hebrew word for man is Adam. And what Adam means is mankind. So catch this. Paul is reading the scriptures, seeing that God created them male and female, and then he named them mankind, Adam. And so God has always been about dealing with and putting the world to rights for all of mankind, not just the Jews, not just the Gentiles. His salvation will be brought for all of mankind. But something has happened with this world. 
In Genesis 1, verse 28, God tells Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, subdue it, have have dominion over the fish, have dominion over the birds, rule over everything that is living on the earth. And God had established that mankind would reign on the earth, exercising dominion over it. But something happens, right? Something destroys that. Something ruins that. In Genesis chapter 3, you don't have to go very far. You see that Adam and Eve, what did they do? God said, don't eat of the fruit of this tree. What do they do? They eat it. Sin comes in. Immediately, once they do that, have that act of rebellion, all of a sudden they see, man, we're naked. We're exposed. Our shame has gone out to God. We are ashamed of what we've done. And God comes in and tells them that now sin has come in. Kicks them out of the garden. And sin is corrupting and is damaging everything in mankind. You see, I want you, you can turn, stay in Genesis chapter 5, but I want to point something out to you. Because God wanted mankind to rule, to have fellowship with him. But instead of mankind ruling, something else is ruling on the earth. And if we're honest, we can say that this is ruling in our lives as well. And when you look at Genesis chapter 5, the author is making a point, and I'm sure all of you will get the point. If you look at the end of verse 5 of Genesis chapter 5, it says, and he died. Go to verse 8. And he died. Verse 11, and he died. Verse 14, and he died. Verse 17, and he died. 20, 27, 31. What is reigning in the world? Death. Sin and death are reigning in the lives of mankind. See, this is a picture of all of us. The moment we are conceived, the moment we're living here on this earth, we all sin. We're all tainted by sin and death. Sin is in us. It is what we do naturally. Naturally, we don't want to obey God. Naturally, we don't want to love God. But each of us are sinning just like they did at the beginning. Then we we escalate a little bit further. Genesis chapter 6, Noah comes on the scene. God looks at the world and sees they're exceedingly wicked. They're doing all kinds of wicked things, and God says, I'm going to have to destroy the earth. I'm going to save one family, and then through them, we'll start again. So he calls Noah out, tells Noah to build the ark, saves Noah through the flood. Noah builds that ark. He's so faithful to do everything God had told him, even though it sounded crazy. The, The floods come. God destroys the earth. Noah and his family are saved through it. Then you look in Genesis chapter 9, I believe. Noah gets out of the boat. He offers a sacrifice to God, praises him, builds an altar to him. And then it's in Genesis 9 where he comes out and he builds a, he creates a farm, plants a vineyard. And then it says this. Then he goes and gets drunk at night and his nakedness was exposed. See, mankind has done nothing but sin and death, sin and death. A couple chapters later, you see all of mankind, they come together, they have, there was one language, they're all working together, and they said, hey, we're gonna build this really huge tower. We're gonna show how powerful and mighty we are. We're gonna, we're gonna reach where God is. And so we're building this tower, and God sees their wickedness and has to say, look what, what they're doing. They're coming together. They're gonna be unstoppable if I don't do something. So he knocks the tower down, changes all the languages, and scatters them across the earth. You see, from the garden, it's gone from bad to worse. Mankind is doing what mankind does, living for their sinful desires. Mankind is lost. Mankind is in spiritual bondage to sin and death. There's so much wrong happening in the world, and mankind is headed towards destruction. So is there hope? Is there a way to make it right? Is there a way, will God ever put the world to rights? And church, we can easily see in our own personal lives how sin has reigned in our life. If we're honest, we can see how many times we've gone out and done what we've wanted to do and broken God's law because sin and death is reigning in our life. 
There might be someone here this morning who maybe they don't believe in God and might even be saying, there is so much injustice in my life. Where is God and why isn't he doing anything about it? Let's see, scriptures tell us that God has and is doing something about it and will do something to fully complete it. You see, in the midst of mankind's pain and suffering from the sting of sin and death, the story of mankind becomes, here's the next thing you notes, know, it's God's story. It's God's story. See, I want you to catch this beautiful truth as we move on. I want you to hear this and understand this. Mankind was doing nothing but rebelling against God. And I want you to catch what God is doing. God is lovingly pursuing mankind to reconcile them back to them. In other words, God is lovingly pursuing man to bring them back into fellowship with him. For us personally, God is lovingly pursuing us to bring us back to him. More pointedly, God is lovingly pursuing you to bring you back to fellowship with him. It is the never-ending loving pursuit of God to bring the world to rights, to show mankind his love, his grace, his salvation. See, God steps in to put the world to rights, and he does it by making a covenant with Abram, Abraham. The next thing you notice is Abraham. And in Genesis chapter 15, you can turn there. God makes a covenant. He begins to say, this is how I'm going to bring the world to rights. This is my story of how I'm moving this forward so that I could take what mankind has destroyed and I can put it to right and I can show them that I am their God, that I am their king, that I can bring salvation to them. And so you have God speaking with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. And this is what he says. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. He said, fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought Abram outside and said, Look towards heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. In here you get a beautiful picture of God making a covenant with Abraham. And what's that covenant? What is that? You can find out what it is because when God tells Abraham, your reward will be great, what does Abraham respond with? Does he go, oh, yes, I'm getting a bunch of camels and horses? Does he say, yes, I'm getting a bunch of cities? He looks at his reward as God has given me a family. So you can look back later. You can look at Genesis chapter 12 where God said through Abraham, He would be a blessing to all the nations, that he would be the father of all the nations of God's people. So here the covenant with Abraham is this, that Abraham, you will be the father of all the nations. It will be as as many as the stars in the sky. Through you, my covenant with you, I'm going to bring salvation to all of mankind through my covenant with you. It says when God gave Abraham that promise and made that covenant, Abraham placed his faith in God's faithfulness to bring that about. And God says, and the the scriptures say that it counted it to him as righteousness. Abraham believed that God would do what he promised to do. And so starting with Abraham, God says, this is what I'm doing. I'm doing this new thing. I'm going to redeem mankind through you, Abraham. Here's a couple little interesting things to note. Abraham was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. Well, how do I know that? Because Abraham gave birth to Isaac. Isaac gave birth to Jacob. And in Genesis chapter 35, God told Jacob and renamed him Israel. 
So even from the beginning of Genesis, God is pointing out that this gospel is not just for Jews. This gospel is available to all mankind. And you see this theme going out over and over again. God has always lovingly pursued mankind. He has always gone after them. And he chose Israel to be his special people, not to say that Israel is going to be the end of all, where I'm just going to save Israel and that's it. He chose Israel to be the vehicle that he would bring salvation to the world. When you look at the scriptures, you see, Israel, you would be a light to the nations. I will bless you so that you will bless others. So catch this. God loves and pursues each of us in this room this morning. But not only that, he is lovingly pursuing everybody in the entire world. That when the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached, its effects are on all of mankind, no matter where people are, are from. Then it moves forward. There's a quote, I love this quote, I came across it by one New Testament scholar. He says this, God's covenant with Abraham was always intended as the means by which the creator God would rescue the whole world from evil, corruption, and death. And his covenant begins with Abraham. And then God's covenant with Abraham culminates in his covenant with, here's the next thing in your notes, David. God makes a covenant with King David. It says this in 2 Samuel. If you want to turn to 2 Samuel, you can turn there. If not, it'll be on the screens for you. It says this in 2 Samuel chapter 7, speaking to David. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. God fulfilled his covenant to Abraham and gave him a son. And through the line of Abraham, you can look at Matthew chapter 1 to figure out how David comes from the line of Abraham. You can look it up on your own time. But David comes from Abraham's family. And God makes a covenant with King David. He tells him that someone will come who will reign on his throne forever. That God is telling David, David's kingdom will never go away. This person would rule for all time. And so the question becomes, when was this person coming? When would he arrive on the scene? How will we know? What are the things that would tell us that this is the one who is to come? See, here's where we find ourselves. At the end of the Old Testament, you find Israel did not have that person on their throne. Yeah, they might have been back in Palestine, but they were living under the empire of Persia. They were not experiencing the blessing that God had promised to them. The Jews were beginning to think that God is not fulfilling. God is not faithful. God is not doing what he said he was going to do. And many became hopeless. Had God forgotten about Israel? Had God forgotten about his promise? Has God given up on mankind? Because here's why. From the Old Testament to the New, it had been 400 years. And they began to think that God had given up on them. Church, can I get personal for a minute? There are many of us that we come to that same line of thinking. We see the wrong that we are suffering. We see the injustice that we have. And we see that God has not put our world to rights. We see that God has not stepped in. And what do we do? We blame God and say, God, you're doing nothing. You're allowing me to suffer and you're sitting up there doing nothing. And then we run to the world for, pro- for solutions. We run to the things of the world to satisfy. We run to the things of the world to give us what we're not getting from God. But see, here's what God wants us to remember and to hold on to. Is that God is always faithful to fulfill his promises. God is always faithful to complete what he has begun. God is always faithful to do what he has said that he will do. That as we wait, as we're waiting for God to put our worlds right, we will put our faith and hope in God and never waver no matter how long it goes. 
No matter how much we suffer, we hold on to the promises of Scripture. You see, we freak out about so many things in our life. And because God doesn't act on our time, we get frustrated. So where you are right now in your life, if you're suffering, what you do now is you hold on to hope. You hold on to your faith. You remember that what God has said he will do, he will do it in your life. At the right time, he will show up. At the perfect time, he will show up. Even if it's unexpected, and a lot of times it will surprise you, but God will show up in your life at the right time. You see, Israel waited 400 years, and then God shows up. And God does something unexpected, out of the blue. He sends Jesus. I want you to turn with me to Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1, the disciple Mark, in just two short verses, says a lot about this guy named Jesus. The world has said a lot of things about Jesus. Said he was just a good teacher. They said he was a lunatic. Said he could be a liar. And others say that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is Lord. And Mark tells us who this man is in Mark chapter 1. He says this. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Verse 3 that we just read, a lot of times we, it's always good when you're reading the Bible and it has like that little letter next to that verse you're reading and you look if you have one of those Bibles and it's like, oh, this comes from this place. Go to that place where you find it because Mark is not just thinking this is a great way to write this. He's pulling it from the scriptures. He wants to make a point very clear because in verse three of Mark chapter one, he's actually pulling that from Isaiah chapter 40. In Isaiah chapter 40, if you look at that chapter, it is talking about how God is finally coming to his people, his people that have been in bondage, who have been in exile. God is coming, bringing them out of bondage and setting them free and reigning over them. And it says this in verse 9 of Isaiah chapter 40. Go up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. It goes on and says, Behold, the Lord your God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are young. And so when Isaiah is saying this, it is God who is coming who will rule with might, but he will also lead like a shepherd. And Mark is saying this about Jesus Christ. And so what is he saying about Jesus? The king is here. Behold your king. And is it not ironic that Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. Is that not how Jesus comes? With might and strength, but he's also a shepherd. He's gentle. You see, Mark is wanting us to understand that Jesus, the king, God has shown up. The king has arrived to bring God's people out of exile so that he will reign over them. In verse 2 of Mark chapter 1, again, Mark is quoting from scriptures. This comes from Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. This is what it says in Malachi. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Jesus is the Lord. He is the king who has come to reign. There is one Lord in this earth, and that is Jesus Christ. 
This is what Mark is getting at. See, here's what I want you to catch. Jesus was sent to be the true Israel. Israel could never be obedient to the law. We as people can never be obedient to the law all on our own. Israel failed over and over again. So God sent Jesus, the Messiah, to be the true Israel who would be obedient even to the point of death. He is the true son of God. And through his death and resurrection from the dead, through the spirit, salvation would be offered to all of mankind. The king is here. See, through Jesus, mankind would see that God, the creator of the universe, had sent Jesus as the Messiah to rule as king and bring mankind out of bondage to sin and death. God is putting the world to rights through King Jesus. This is precisely the backstory that the Apostle Paul has in mind when he mentions the gospel of God in Romans chapter one. He has seen how God has worked throughout the scriptures and how he will remain faithful to fulfill everything he has said that he would do. So the second question we have today as we wrap it up is this. How is it the gospel, the power of God? How is it the power of God? Romans 1.16 says again, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You see, Paul says that he is not ashamed of this gospel as he describes it in Romans chapter 1, verse 3 through 4. He's not ashamed to preach it. He's not ashamed to declare it because Jesus is the king. And Jesus is reigning as Lord and is putting the world to rights. So he is not ashamed to go out and say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. You see, to understand the beauty of what Paul is doing here, let's back up for a minute. Paul is living in the times of the Roman Empire. And the the Romans believed that their Caesar, their emperor, was God. And they would call him Lord. In Greek, they would use the word kurios, which means Lord. It's the same word that Paul uses to call Jesus Lord. And they believed that Caesar was all powerful, that Caesar was going to reign and he was going to bring justice and he was going to bring peace and he was going to bring love. And so they all looked to Caesar as Lord. Paul comes on the scene and says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because Jesus is Lord, not your Caesar. There is one king, one Savior, one Lord, and that's Jesus Christ. And because he reigns, It demands obedience and faith. You see, whenever a king would take over, a new emperor would take over a land, it says that they would send a herald out to make the proclamation. Would you ever see a herald come out and do this? Hey guys, uh, you just got defeated by our emperor, so he's a really nice guy, and um, I think you should try him out. And if you want to be a part of his kingdom, it's really cool. There's some cool benefits, but if you don't, I mean, you die. I mean, so you might want to try it out, maybe. Is that how the heralds did it? The heralds came out and said, Caesar is king. And what that meant is it demanded your obedience. Paul says, Jesus is king. He is what the scriptures say he is. He is Lord of your life and in him he will bring you out of bondage and your response to that declaration is obedience and faith. It's faith in believing in what God has done through Jesus Christ. You see, Paul is saying this to Caesar and what a slap in the face to hear somebody preaching, Jesus is king, not you, Caesar. Caesar. There's one God, one king. Here's the next thing I put in my notes. How is it the power of God? Well, it is God's ability to fulfill his covenant promises. It is God's ability 
to fulfill his covenant promises. You see, God showed that Jesus was king because the Romans used their ultimate weapon to humiliate and to shame, which was the cross. Curses every man who hangs on a tree, right? Well, the Roman Empire used the cross to show you are utterly defeated, you are humiliated, you are ashamed. They take Jesus, they put him on the cross to show you're humiliated, you're shamed, and you are utterly defeated. And what happens? Does Jesus stay dead? No. The Spirit raises Jesus to life. The ultimate weapon used by the, by the Roman Empire is defeated in Jesus Christ. And Jesus comes out and says, through his resurrection, through the Spirit, Jesus has popped on the scene and says, God is remaining faithful to his covenant. He has raised Jesus from the dead to be Lord and King. And he is going to fulfill his covenant promises. Verse 17 of chapter 1 says this. Talking about the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The power of God does not belong to the messenger. Whenever the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached, it's never found in the power of those presenting it. It's not in the eloquence of speech. It's not in having, I have 75 arguments I'm going to use, and when somebody says this, I'm going to respond with this. It's not dependent upon you. The very message of Jesus Christ is the power of God. What does it mean? In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. What does that mean? How is the righteousness of God revealed? The righteousness of God is his faithfulness to his covenant promises. I'll say it again. The righteousness of God is his faithfulness to his covenant promises. That God will bring justice to the world. He will set to right all the things that have gone wrong. It is through his faithfulness to his covenant promises that we see the righteousness of God. And you say, what does it mean that it is revealed? How is it revealed? When the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached, as Paul describes it, it's revealed in the sense that people will hear that message and they, for the very first time, will have their eyes opened and their ears to, to hear that Jesus is king. And through faith in Jesus Christ, they are brought out of the bondage from sin and death and ushered into new life a new identity, a new creation, and part of the new thing that God is doing. That's how it is revealed. All of us that have claimed Christ as Savior, were your eyes not opened when the gospel of Jesus Christ was spoken to you? And you saw for the first time, it was like God pulled back a curtain and said, here I am, behold your God. That's what Paul means, that in it, God's faithfulness to fulfill his covenant promises when somebody hears that and gives their life to Christ in faith, God is revealed. It's not just believing the facts, but it's the power of God spiritually changing their hearts and minds so that they can see who God is and respond to King Jesus in faith. We get down, you get to some little confusing wording in, chapter, in verse 17. It says, from faith to faith. You might, what does that mean? from faith to faith. What is Paul talking about? Here's what it means. The apostle Paul has seen that every time he's preached this message about God's faithfulness to his covenant to fulfill what he has said he was going to do, that people respond in faith. You with me? So Paul preaches the gospel and people respond. God is faithful to his promises. Here's what he's done through Jesus Christ. Preaches Jesus and people respond in faith. So the gospel is going from God's faithfulness to human faithfulness. Does that make sense? Are you with me? You got that? Clear as mud, as Pastor Brian would say. Uh, so in other words, God's ability to fulfill his covenant promises culminates in the faith of his people. To make the point further, to hit it home, Paul says at the end of verse 17, the righteous shall live by faith. And again, has one of those little letters goes back to Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. And what's going on in Habakkuk 2? The Chaldean army has marched into Israel, has taken them over, and it seems 
that all hope is lost. They're now suffering. They're under oppression. What do we do? And God looks at the prophet Habakkuk, and he tells him, here's what you do. No matter how wicked or sinful the nation is where you find yourself, you hold on to hope that I will do what I have promised to do without failing, without wavering. See, in the same way Paul is telling us, no matter how sinful our culture gets, no matter how much suffering you endure, no matter how much injustice you faith you face, hold on to hope that God will do everything that he has said he will do. Here's the last thing. I put it in my notes um, this way. God's covenant faithfulness results in salvation for mankind. God's covenant faithfulness results in salvation for mankind. And again, from Romans chapter 1, 16, it is the, sal- the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I just want to show with you real quick um, in Romans chapter 5, I'm going to read three verses out of there in Romans 5. And it describes beautifully what God has done from the beginning through now through Jesus Christ. It says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Verse 15 says, But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And in verse 18 says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. What's the point? God has lovingly pursued mankind. The creator has sent Jesus, the Messiah, our king, to bring his people out of spiritual bondage to sin and death. And all those who place their faith in them are given a new identity as God's people, as God's children. And they are set free from the bondage of sin and death. And so is this all that God will do? No, in the future he will get rid of all evil. Death will no longer have its hold over us. He will set all things right. There will be a new creation to set the world to rights. But to receive this salvation, it is necessary for us to have faith in the gospel of Jesus. When we place our faith in Jesus, God's faithfulness reaches down to us, secures our salvation that can never be taken away from us. You read the end of Romans chapter 8, you will see those who are in Christ, there is nothing that could separate you from God's loving pursuit of you. You are his forever. There's a quote by Tom Wright I want to share with you. He says this, This is how God has put the world to rights, declares the gospel message about Jesus, and this is how God will put you right as well. You see, the story of the scriptures is a story of each of us personally. And we can look at the story of Israel and say, how dare they, how shame them. But really, this is our story. Because each of us have sinned like Israel had sinned. There's not one of us in this room that could sit back and say, I've done nothing wrong. I've obeyed everything. I am a good person. Scriptures show the opposite of that. Apart from God, we are evil, wicked sinners trapped in sin and bondage. See, and here's the truth Paul wants you to hear this morning. God and Jesus, God has fulfilled his covenant promises. Jesus is the king of the earth. And because he is king, it demands your obedience and faith. And I'll close with a few words. The president is not the king. Your family is not king. Your career is not king of your life. Your boss is not king, even though he or she might think so. (laughs) Your lusts, your addictions are not king. And ultimately, yourself is not king. Jesus is king. 
no matter whether you believe it or not. Jesus is reigning as king. And so this morning, it demands a response from us. Because he is king. He is Lord. But the one thing earthly kings and kingdoms could never give, peace, justice, love, is exactly what Jesus provides through his kingdom. Justice, peace, love, security. And God is looking at you this morning and saying, when you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, of who he is, that he is king, is today the day that you are seeing for the first time that God has revealed his righteousness to you through Jesus. If God unveiled himself to you this morning to show you that Jesus is king and can put your world to rights, your response is crying out to God in faith and saying, I believe that Jesus is king. I believe that Jesus is Lord. Fall at Jesus' feet. 